Okay, uh, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you're watching us. My name is Maria Skura, I'm uh, Head of International Dialogue at Das Progressive Zentrum, and I will host the session today, the last session of day one of the Inocracy Conference. And so our session is called Concrete Futures, what should our cities of tomorrow look like? So that already indicates uh, the topic we're going to talk about. Uh, we want to focus on the future visions of our cities, of um, our urban areas, uh, the cities we would like to live in. But um, maybe not only those future images uh, are the focal point of our conversation today, but also how to get there. Uh, what are the methodologies of developing those future visions? What are the ways of um, democratizing the debate about future uh, cities and also co-creating and collaborating on the future visions? So, uh, on the one hand, we would like to invite you uh, to reflect on um, the urban spaces um, of tomorrow, but at the same time uh, to do some backcasting and think how also uh, to reach uh, those visions and make them come true. So that's the topic and uh, also we'd like to offer you a slightly different format today. Um, this session is not a traditional uh, panel or a podium debate. We want to invite you to a reflection, to a reflection session, so to deep dive in the topic, uh, not to be shy uh, and uh, to um, take uh, what is being said, take your time and reflect upon the visions and ideas we will be presenting today. Um, our session uh, is planned for uh, 75 minutes and to achieve all those goals uh, we divided it into three blocks. So first uh, we will listen to an inspiring keynote uh, presenting <laughs> some of the visions uh, then uh, I will cordially invite you to join, uh, to join breakout sessions uh, in which uh, you may um, get to know each other. So that's particularly for people now in Zoom, uh, for participants who are joining us uh, through uh, that connection. And uh, to brainstorm a little bit and reflect on what was said. And then um, at the end uh, we will uh, finish with the third block, so to speak, and with responses. We have invited three fantastic speakers uh, to join us and to think with us about the future vision of the cities. So um, this is more or less the agenda for today uh, and I will happily guide us uh, through uh, this session. Uh, it is also possible to see us um, on the website of the conference, uh, Inocracy uh, EU, and this session is also live tweeted. Nevertheless, um, if you want to ask questions or share your comments, uh, please use the chat function in Zoom to do so. But that still will come. And uh, without uh, further ado and uh, uh, looking at the time, I would like to invite you now to the first, um, uh, to the keynote, uh, to the opening keynote, so to listen to our first speaker today. It's uh, Franziska Schreiber who is a researcher at, uh, and a lecturer at the University of Stuttgart uh, at the Institute of Urban Planning and Design. She's also senior associate at Adelphi, a think tank in Berlin. And uh, she uh, is focusing in her work in particular on the topics of uh, urban experimentation, innovation and planning, pra planning practices, and new ways of co-producing visions for the cities of tomorrow. So, as you can see, when we were thinking whom to invite, uh, uh, Francisca was an obvious uh, candidate and a very good candidate for this opening session. So enjoy, and uh, Francisca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for the kind introduction and thank you for having me. It's really um, a pleasure to be part of uh, Inocracy and this uh, amazing panel. As said, I'm Franziska Schreiber, I'm an 
urban uh, sociologist and urban planner by profession. I teach and do research at the Institute of Urban Planning uh, and Design at the University of Stuttgart and I'm also associated with uh, Adelphi which is a think tank based here in Berlin also doing uh, public policy consultancy. Uh, and I'm supposed to see my presentation in front of me. Uh, here we go, perfect. Uh, we can already jump to the next uh, slide because what I would like to do uh, in the next couple of minutes or 15 minutes are basically three things. I want to, I want to focus on three aspects. First, I would like to take a look at uh, the way urban futures are currently being framed and uh, yeah, the kind of visions that are dominating the discourse and what might be problematic about them. Secondly, uh, I would like to talk about why it is so crucial to co-design uh, the vision of the future and what methodological challenges we may encounter. And third, I would like to introduce you to a project which is called uh, Sense the City, uh, a project I've heard of on where we collected and explored urban imaginaries, people's and people's wishes for the, uh, for the future city by using the human senses as a starting point and what we can uh, learn from the outcome of, uh, of, these, uh, yeah, of this project. So let's start with the current, uh, with the current discourse. Um, I actually often hear the argument that we hardly have any uh, future visions for the city or for the urban future, but I don't think that's really true because there are numerous visions and kind of imaginaries floating uh, around. I mean, just think of uh, a smart city, maybe click to the next slide, please. Um, it's, it's basically the first one you'll encounter when attending conferences on urban future. It's the first one to appear uh, if you search uh, the city of tomorrow on the internet. Uh, and it's actually quite interesting, but also a bit scary to see how strongly big technology companies like IBM, Cisco, or Siemens already shape the image of the future city and the direction we are taking. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then apart from the smart city visions, of course, you will find architectural visions for the future city. They are often developed by star architects. There are beautiful renderings um, where, for example, buildings or entire cities are wrapped in nature. Uh, a prominent example is, for, uh, for example, the Bosco Verticale or the Lizu Forest City um, developed by Stefano Boeri, and you can see the image here uh, on, the, on the right side. Uh, very prominent examples, and they're very, very innovative in terms of reducing CO2 emissions, in terms of increasing biodiversity, but they also clearly tell us the nar narrative that with the state of the art technology, we will arrive at climate neutral cities. And this is something I'll get back to in a second. And then next, um, you also have city visions, which are kind of developed in the context of strategic planning processes, for example. And such visions are often pretty comprehensive. They look at all kinds of sectors of urban development. They're pretty solid but not necessarily visionary or very ambitious. And they're also often characterized by a rather, I would say, technical language, which makes it pretty difficult for any ordinary person to relate to it on, on an emotional or a motivational level. So my point here really is that we do have visions and we do have narratives for the future. But the question is, do they represent the future we want? whose vision do they actually represent? And are they enough in terms of radicality and social impetus? And I think here lies the problem. Because when I participated uh, at the Z2X Festival in 2018, it's an annual festival organized by Zeit Online, targeting young visionaries in their trendies. And I showed these images and I showed these uh, visions their reaction was pretty, pretty clear because they said this is not the future they want and this is not the kind of city they want to live in. So apparently there seems to be a huge discrepancy between what is considered the way forward among urban experts on the one hand and what people are hoping for on the other hand. And here I see two major reasons for this, for this gap. Next. 
Because I think that these visions reflect rather, I would say, a technical approach rather than a, a normative one, because most visions we are having are te techno nature visions. And this is what I just talked about with respect to the architectural visions. And they do have their justification, don't get me wrong. But the problem is that we hardly have any societal visions. I mean, just think of the visions I just showed you, the images, there are hardly any human beings in these pictures because we, tend to focus on finding technological solutions to current, uh, to current problems, but often forget to have a proactive, really normative societal discussion about the future we want. What kind of society do we want to be? What kind of city do we want to be? But shouldn't that be actually the first step we should take? Shouldn't we first develop a position towards a certain issue before we introduce a, um, a technological innovation. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and this is why I like uh, the current discourse and um, the, the, the image here on the right side, um, which is an installation by uh, C40 and Arup and the city of Copenhagen, which is called 25 Questions for Cities, because it really raises the big issues of our time. And it demands a position to very essential questions. For example, should autonomous cars be the future or not? Should we punish incorrect disposal of garbage or is it a matter for each individual? And I think those questions need to be asked and need to be discussed. Um, and we have to do that much more. Next slide, please. And that brings me to the, to the, second, uh, to the second issue I see here, which is that the discourse currently reflects an expert dialogue and not a societal one. Because if we are honest to ourselves, then the city of tomorrow is still an issue for experts. Much of it is, is being discussed in, 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 and decided in conferences and behind closed meeting rooms. Uh, and it leaves little room for citizens actually to contribute their wishes and their ideas. And of course, there are exceptions. Um, and we have really front runner cities like Barcelona, or Madrid, or Paris, or Copenhagen, um, which, which are definitely advanced here. But the norm is that citizens are involved on an occasional basis and event related. So we're involving them when there's a particular project or when we are redesigning public spaces, but we don't do that on an ongoing basis. And we don't do that with respect to more fundamental questions. And if visions are being discussed and communicated, then there's also the problem that this is very often done in a super technocratic way in abstract planning categories and the numbers, which is just quite difficult for any ordinary person to follow. Next one, please. And I think this is something we need to change. And this is something we need to understand that if we don't or that we have to develop visions of the future uh, as a joint effort because they will only be effective if they are negotiated and worked out together and if they have an em em emotional value and, uh, and a visual mes message that goes beyond just sober figures because only then it can trigger feelings and only then it can create identification and only then we will be able to motivate people to act. And I think this is something we should bear in mind and, and take as a starting point now when we are discussing the post-corona city. Next one, please. But the question of course is, so how, how do we now, how do we get there? How do we co-create uh, positive visions for the future city, visions that are inspiring, that offer new perspective and have the societal imp uh, impulse and impetus we are, we are looking for. Because methodologically, that's actually not a very easy task. Because thinking about the future is difficult and it's difficult for everyone. Because as soon as we start discussing future, we become very pragmatic and sometimes also very pessimistic. 
And I learned that lesson pretty hard when I interviewed city planners and politicians and architects about their dreams and wishes for the future city. And I saw how much they struggled expressing what they want from the future and how quickly they actually switched into the problem solving mode and just started repeating what the current discourse already states. And so this is then when my colleagues and I at the Delphi uh, decided and also started wondering, okay, so how can we change that? What can we do differently? How can we break through these habitual thought patterns and encourage people to enjoy and have fun thinking about the future? So take a much more optimistic uh, perspective and also how can we trigger imagination and help them explore their wishes? Next one, please. And this is when we initiated um, Sense the City, uh, the Sense the City project in 2018, uh, and decided, okay, we want to try out something different. We want to search for people's ideas and imaginaries, imaginaries of the urban future by using the level of the human senses. Because we felt maybe we don't only need spaces for thinking, but also spaces for feeling. Next one, please. And so we decided to ask how the city of the future should look like, how it should smell, how it should taste, how it should feel. Next one, please. And then in, in 2018 and 2019, so basically one year, we then toured through Germany and we went to Italy. And in total, we conducted seven visioning workshops with 120 people in total. We visited all kinds of cities of different sizes, from uh, the, the small uh, city of Finsterwalde in eastern Germany to Berlin, but also we went to Milan. And we worked with different people with different backgrounds, from primary school pupils to university professors to pensioners. And in our workshops, we combined sensory methods with methods from futurology and design thinking. Well, what does that mean? Next one, please. So first, when we started the workshop, we always um, sent people uh, on, on multi-sensory uh, walks uh, and let them write sensory diaries because we wanted to, first of all, raise the awareness for the environment. How does it sound? How does it smell? What do they like about certain streets and what do they don't like about certain streets? And it was super interesting to see how poetic almost uh, the sensory diaries turned out and how clearly people were, ex were able to express what was good for them and what wasn't. Next one, please. And then after um, we had sent them on the multisensory uh, walks, we had them work in smaller groups with samples of sound, with samples of material, sense, taste, uh, as well as visual stimuli because we wanted to trigger um, yeah, emotions and, and memories. And here you can see uh, a few photos of how that looked like. And after that, we had them write narratives of the future city using scenarios and prototyping their future city by using um, their senses. And the results, they were really, really interesting and in many respects. Next one, please. Um, some actually turned out like art pieces, which you can see here, but also content-wise, they were very, very interesting. Next one, please. We had, for example, uh, the proposal for a mobile and inflatable space for temporary community. You have to yeah, imagine it being like a balloon, which can be enlarged or reduced at will, which provides people with a place to mingle and exchange, but without having to consume. And it also was meant to provide a solution to an ever-changing city and the growing need for a more flexible and adaptable social infrastructure. Next one, please. We also had the proposal, for example, which I liked a lot for a sensory app. So a sensory app, uh, kind of an, a navigation map that would not recommend the fastest way from A to B through the city but the most pleasant one, taking into account how the city would smell, how the city sounds, but also your emotional um, state and your level of energy, perhaps. Next one, please. 
And then we had suggestions for establishing a culture of urban experimentations. The huge parts of the city were reserved for temporary interventions and real world experiments to let people really experience what, what possible futures could be like. And I could, you know, uh, uh, continue with, with the different ideas that came up, um, but I don't have so much time. So I would like to wrap up um, my presentation with three um, things that I took away from, from this project and what I learned. Uh, next one. Because what I very clearly saw is that really people want to co-create the future, but they need the right tools and the right formats to really take part in the visioning exercise. And I think there's a lot of homework on our side to do. Um, but the level of energy and optimism we saw in our workshop was really incredible. And I think it had a lot to do with that the human, using the human senses as an entry point in the visioning process just opened a whole new, new door for people to explore and express their wishes and needs um, and made them feel part of a conversation they can relate to. So all of a sudden the future discourse was no longer just an expert discourse but became a common kind of exploratory exercise and I think this is something we should really take into account when we are now discussing you know what comes after Corona, how should the post-Corona city look like and use this energy and like kiss awake this energy which is actually there. Uh, next one, please. But then we also noticed that the city of the future will actually look differently. And, uh, next one, please. Because if you start exploring cities and thinking about cities, and, from a sensorial emotional experience and from a, the from the human psyche uh, you will arrive at cities which would, which will look differently they will be healthier they will be more colorful they will be more natural they will be more mobile they will be more communal and much more oriented towards the wishes and needs of people um, because we realized that when we compared the visions that were produced in our workshops with the visions I just showed you earlier, that there, there, were, there was a huge discrepancy. They looked very, very different. Next one, please. And the last thing I take away from this project is that you sometimes, I think, need less head and more heart, and this will get us much further. Next one, please. Because I think if we want to motivate people to really actively shape their future, then we can't restrict ourselves just to rational and cognitive discussions. I'm really convinced that the future also needs to be experienced sensorially and emotionally. And I think this is why real world experiments are so powerful because they turn the abstract discussions and abstract terms into a tangible and negotiable subject. And in a way, they are creating multi-sensory future spaces that give us a taste of how tomorrow could be like. And that affects us emotionally. And I think that is just so much more effective than any number. So I leave it here uh, just as a, a quick promotion, <laughs> maybe the next uh, last slide. Um, so what we have done now is we have uh, put together the, uh, the, the, um, the results uh, of the project in the magazine and also in a toolkit for how to make futuring and, and urban planning more sensory. And this magazine will be launched on the 18th of November from 6 to 7.30. So if you're interested, just get in touch with me. Uh, you will find my um, email address down there. And yeah, I look forward to our discussion later. Thank you. Wow. Francisca Schreiber, thank you very, very <laughs> much for this inspiring keynote on negotiating the future of cities between technological progress and human scale, between uh, uh, pragmatism and idealism, uh, head and heart, as you put it, uh, <laughs> very, uh, very beautifully. Uh, I think you've left us with a lot of food for thought and many questions to be answered. And uh, that's great because now we're going to invite um, the participants who watch us over Zoom to uh, exchange with each other 
in uh, uh, breakout sessions uh, exa exchange exactly on what you've just said. So, dear participants, um, please, uh, first of all, get to know each other and then uh, please engage in the conversation on uh, the visions or, and the way to the visions um, that we have just heard of. And you will have 15 minutes uh, to do it and uh, perhaps to help you uh, structure or organize uh, your conversations, I can suggest two questions uh, that you can try to answer uh, within this quarter of an hour. Um, first of all, so uh, what stays with you uh, from Francisca's keynote? Uh, what has striked you? Uh, what uh, was surprising or uh, what would you like to take? What have you learned? And most importantly, do you think about the future of the cities differently than at 8 hour, at 8, at 8 p.m. today? Uh, please note down your questions, please note down your comments. Uh, you're also able to submit them via the chat function of, of Zoom. It will be great to engage you in the next uh, in the next phase of our of our session in the uh, response uh, session that will continue after breakout sessions. So please not only talk but also note down uh, what you've been talking about. What would you like to ask our uh, expert, our speakers that are still about to join us? And as of now, um, have fun and see you later. Welcome back to our session on the cities of the future. Uh, I hope you had a fruitful discussions in the breakout uh, rooms. Um, I hope you've met interesting people, learned something new and exchanged on the topics that you find interesting and also uh, found some common topics with others. And so we are meeting now in the third part of, of our encounter today and uh, we will continue their reflection on, uh, uh, not only based on Francisca's keynote uh, that <laughs> we've uh, heard a few minutes ago, but also let's try to think about the future and uh, brainstorm together what the future visions of the, for the cities could look like and, and how to achieve them. And to do so, we have, introduced, we have invited three more speakers, distinguished speakers with a fantastic expertise and experiences uh, with, in city-related topics uh, and not only. And so please allow me to introduce to you uh, first uh, Francesca Bria, uh, who is the president of the Italian National Innovation Fund and also honorary professor in the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at the University College uh, of uh, London, and also senior advisor to UN Habitat. And uh, Francesca is also one of 50 most influential women in the tech scene, according to Forbes. So it's fantastic to have you uh, with us today. Uh, her topics are uh, digital cities, digital rights, data sovereignty, in Europe. So wonderful expertise and a very interesting insight to bring to the debate. And next we uh, have with us today um, Rita Padawangi who is a senior lecturer uh, at the Singapore University of Social Sciences. So it's fantastic to so have a voice from outside the European bubble. Uh, Rita, welcome to our session. Uh, she's also a coordinator of the uh, Southeast Asia Neighborhoods Network and uh, her research interests um, include placemaking, sociology of architecture and uh, participatory urban development. Rita, great to have you here. And last but not least, joining us from France is Cédric, Cédric Villani, who is a mathematician uh, a member of the French Academy of Sciences and uh, Pontifical uh, Academy of Sciences, also member of the French National Assembly. Uh, on top of that, also vice uh, president of the Europa Nova Think Tank, our sister organization in Paris. Uh, so, and and, and uh, Cédric is passionate about the relationship between 
the society and science. So we have a great mix of uh, topics and a great mix of perspectives. And I would um, uh, like to do the following. I would like to invite our three great speakers to give short responses to what they have heard from uh, Franziska. And then uh, please don't forget uh, you uh, uh, friends and colleagues in the audiences to submit your questions and comments via the chat function of Zoom because uh, next to the conversation we will be having here, the five of us, we would be delighted to involve also you in our dialogue. So uh, let's start this uh, reflection and then Francesca, let's start with you, the floor is yours. What has, uh, what are you taking uh, from uh, Francisca's uh, presentation and uh, what you think are the key factors uh, that are shaping the cities of tomorrow? Uh, what are the key factors to make beautiful visions of the cities of tomorrow? Please try to keep the time discipline of between three and five minutes. The floor is yours. Sure, thank you very much and, and thanks for the interesting format. Um, that we are here to uh, comment and discuss. So let me first just say that I think in this moment uh, of uh, the pandemic and uh, now again another wave of this uh, health crisis that's uh, really uh, threatening uh, Europe and uh, it's um, imposing us a, an emergency and probably one of the uh, biggest crises that we have seen uh, in many years because it's a healthcare crisis, but it's also an economic crisis and a social crisis. I think that it's absolutely critical to put at the center of our um, policies, but also our public discourse, uh, uh, the capacity of people to come together uh, to reimagine our societies and our economies and to be able not only to create more resilience, so to strengthen communities, to strengthen workers, to strengthen citizens and our ability to respond uh, to the emergency, but also uh, to really strengthen our capacity to look at the future. So to uh, not only act in an emergency, but be able to propose um, for forward-looking uh, visions that are about this kind of ecological carbon neutral transition, a sustainable digitization and more social justice and social cohesion. So we have to, uh, I think, putting communities, territories, cities and citizens at the moment at the center of shaping this future, I think it would be very critical for all of us, for nation states, for Europe and for the world. So this is why this conversation, I think it's very important to have it now. Uh, to comment on what I've heard, I think uh, for me, uh, I mean, I, you didn't mention in the introduction that I've been the chief technology officer in Barcelona for the last five years before um, coming to Italy and taking on my role now as the president of the Innovation Fund. So I've been, let's say, on the ground to try to shape a people first uh, uh, digital city uh, program. And I have to say that for me, it is very much when we are talking about um, creating, uh, shaping future cities. In reality, we are taught it's about democracy. So we are talking about reshaping the relationship between citizens and governments. And we're talking about um, giving the possibilities uh, for people and communities to decide the priorities of the political action. So what cities are we building for whom and, uh, and, and how are we going about shaping this kind of political vision? So maybe for me, more than a normative question, it's a deeply political question. And um, I think that obviously we have to move away from any vision, any uh, tech, like technological solutionist vision. I mean, it is not about um, a vision, a techno vision of the future where we have lots of technology and gadgets shining, but we're hiding from the fundamental questions of, for example, who is controlling the critical infrastructures of the future, who owns the data, how are we redistributing in the wealth which is created uh, from uh, these future cities and how do we make sure that we create social and public value 
and not only that we give the possibilities of few private players to uh, to aggregate a lot of market power, a lot of industrial power, and a lot of social power. And uh, so I think that for me, uh, the, the most important thing is starting uh, through participatory democracy. So instead of starting with technology, for example, connectivity, sensor network and data, and only after asking why do we need a smart city at all? What are we going to do with this technology? We should start from what is important for people, affordable housing, the fight against climate change, better healthcare, better education, more democratic participation. And only after we should ask how we can use um, emerging technology, connectivity, sensor and data if governed in a democratic way to leverage collective intelligence of people and to be able to address the fundamental um, social, environmental, and political challenges that we are facing. And let me also add that obviously, uh, since now technology is pervasive in our societies, in our economies, but in particular in the urban fabric, I think it's very important to, to uh, democratize access to data in particular, because as we know, data is the raw material of the digital economy and uh, it fuels artificial intelligence and who will be able to aggregate and access this data and use it also uh, in order to create a data driven healthcare education to fight climate change to shape better policies, we'll be also able to determine the rules and the governance structures of our society in the future. So I think we should really, as society, starting from citizens and cities, take back democratic control of digital infrastructures, take back data sovereignty for the citizens, which is more than privacy. Because, of course, we can use decentralized privacy enhancing technology to protect people's fundamental rights and privacy. But we also want to enable a culture of sharing because we want to unleash the social, economic and public value of this data and the technological revolution. So we want to, uh, I mean, in Barcelona, uh, we, are, we were talking about data as a public infrastructure, as a common good, like water, like electricity, like the air we breathe. And then we can reclaim back the value of this data and unleash it. I mean, also, you know, collaborating with innovators, with startups, with the social economy, with citizens themselves, so that then we are able to, to make better planning decisions, to use data uh, for healthcare, for, for public transportation, uh, and, and so on. So I think let's put forward our policy priorities, which is obvious that at the moment it's going to be very much linked to the ecological transformation and, and, and our objective to be car car carbon neutral. Lots of the exciting projects are happening in cities. We need to decarbonize our economy, to shift into uh, electrifying the transportation, to make it more sustainable, to triple bicycle lanes, to take away the cars from the city center and give back more public space to the citizens. Uh, we need to make um, our waste management more effective. We need to improve how our cities is a run. And so we need to put the technology at the service of people and the ecological transition. And I think um, this is our fundamental challenge, which basically it's going to be about um, a sustainability, which is going to be social and environmental, leveraging the power of digital technology, but putting people, the fundamental rights at the very core. So I think basically we are talking about a new uh, model for uh, technological sovereignty, which is going to be, we, it's going to have to be at the European level, but I'm arguing we have to start from the ground up from cities and citizens in order to experiment this new vision uh, on the daily, uh, in the daily life uh, to improve the life of citizens. Thank you so much. Uh, more democracy or democracy first, technology second. Thank you so much. And now let's move to Singapore to Rita. Rita, what's your take on that topic? 
Uh, thank you, Ma Maria. Um, I I actually uh, really enjoyed uh, the 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 keynote speech, and I I actually uh, really agree that uh, we do have a challenge here in which uh, the future visions of our cities are very much uh, dominated by uh, these uh, technocratic and very pragmatic uh, problem-solving models uh, of the future, and these are seemingly uh, reserved for uh, the technocrats and the uh, the so-called experts uh, of uh, making cities, and uh, this uh, uh, comes across as these very much like beautifully rendered kind of uh, images of the future, um, but at the same time really missing uh, the components of the people uh, who are in those cities. Um, and I guess uh, the, the, the approach uh, since the city, I think is actually very interesting as well because it starts with a very, uh, very simple exercise that uh, that basically it empowers uh, people uh, that they can actually uh, do something. Uh, these are very basic uh, fundamental experiences uh, that actually matters. Now, I, 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 I actually, when, when I saw uh, the presentations, I, I could help it but to reflect uh, on what is uh, actually going on uh, in, in, in this part of the world uh, since uh, here we also observe this uh, kind of like very much domination of everything technology, everything moving into like all this artificial intelligence in sort of like determining. So it's, it's, it's very much a deterministic uh, visions of the future in which the human beings, uh, basically the citizens of the cities, uh, 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 are, are sort of like becoming uh, more comfortable and it's more sort of focusing on convenience uh, rather than all these uh, kinds of uh, methods to actually participate in co-creating the city. Um, I think I, I really agree. I think all of us here agree that we do need more participation. We need to democratize our cities uh, and we do have a lot of things on our plates like uh, each and every one of us um, and I also want to highlight that I also agree that the city is actually uh, something that is, is a political entity uh, it's not just this very much managerial kind of uh, um, entity um, but in terms of uh, seeing the city as something that is political that one also we need to think about how to reclaim that because it seems that nowadays the the, the term politics itself also already get a bad name like instead of uh, thinking that everybody uh, has something to do in uh, thinking and in discussing about uh, what our cities mean to us and what we want for for the future city um, it seems that uh, those kinds of discussions and also spaces for those discussions are also shrinking uh, uh, and uh, this actually to make way for a more so-called rational kind of decision making that are sort of like determined by all these computations of the technologies. Uh, now, I also want to um, highlight that uh, while I think the, the approach of the city uh, is really interesting, I think we also need to think a bit more about how to move forward uh, in which, you know, all these sensorial experiences, they actually start from individuals, which are very important, of course, in our cities. I mean, the individuals are the citizens, right? And they need, uh, and each citizen needs to participate in the making of cities. Uh, but at the same time, the cities are uh, not just a collection of individual experiences, but the city is also a place of organizing. So it starts, it, it moves, uh, it actually transcends and also have to uh, dialogically uh, uh, make this uh, uh, interaction between the and the communal. So how to actually transform all these individual experiences into the communal. And I think there are actually uh, uh, challenges for that. Uh, first of all, we do see, uh, 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 for example, the uh, the domination of government control, for example, in, in our uh, in, in, in managing this, uh, especially with the current pandemic, it seems that um, there is sort of like this uh, uh, this notion of uh, the control that is sort of like very much uh, centralized. Um, and at the same time, uh, the global finance capital 
that are behind all these technologies as well as all these uh, nice renderings of the uh, architects that are really kind of hegemonic, right? It's 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 sort of like influencing the ways the ways in which uh, people actually think and react to them. So we can't really assume that all these uh, democratization uh, start from uh, a vacuum. We start from something that is uh, that is in front of us, and we do uh, need to acknowledge that there are these challenges to challenge all these hege hegemonic uh, uh, images of uh, future cities. Okay, uh, I, I think I'll stop there to uh, to uh, give the time back to to you, Maria. Thank you very much, Rita. That was uh, fascinating what you were saying, especially bringing the issue of politics and looking at the city also as a uh, political unit and uh, reclaiming the city also in that term, uh, who does politics and who decides uh, policies. And that, uh, I think, is a perfect bridge in, uh, uh, to in invite the third speaker. And uh, Cedric, uh, so uh, how do you uh, answer these questions? Uh, what's the future vision? Uh, first, okay, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, indeed, challenges for cities currently are huge. These are, this is the organization of the, of the space, of the relation between people, of the co whatever, uh, whatever logistics you have to do. Currently, as we are in uh, this uh, difficult pandemic wave, the issue of how a city is organized is a very tough issue that we have to rethink. But it's also how to adapt to climate change, how to organize the uh, fluidification of the, of the traffic, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's estimated often that ecological transition, environmental transition, is like two-thirds local level, one-third global level. Local level meaning a lot of what is organized in the cities, what kind of public transportation, what kind of heating system, what kind of uh, a lot of local things. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of the weight of the decision and transition is on the shoulders of deciders at the scale of the cities. Let me insist also on the, 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 the challenge posed by the aging of the population in many countries and the way to reorganize things in a way that is adapted to that, uh, to that fact. Let me insist on a few concepts that were apparent also in the previous interventions. The first, I will um, insist on the design is politics uh, phrase. It's often used in the context of uh, uh, AI and communications and uh, digital privacy and so on. It's also very clear for the organization of cities. And the choices that are made in the, for, the, for the cities about where to put the public places, how to organize the transport and so on, are not just uh, based on calculations and optimization. They are also all a lot uh, depending on political choices, what kind of society you want to live in. So it's impossible to imagine that the plan for a city is not organized in a, in a political way. I could see it very much in the, uh, my political life. All the, the issues about how to administrate the cities are not just issues of efficiency, they are also issues of political values and how to organize the world in which we live. The second is the dialogue between tech and non-tech, and I fully tech and non-tech, and I fully concur with what was said. You cannot build a modern city or organize a modern city without the computations and the simulations and whatever. It can be for big buildings, can be for the organization of the uh, energy, can be for the simulation of the traffic, and so on. But you need to add to that the uh, opinions of the people and in many ways some irrational factors and also the history of the, of the city. I remember one such organization and conference in which there was a debate about uh, uh, smart cities and so on. And there was the uh, talk by uh, an engineer from uh, uh, one of the big tech companies telling of all the wonderful things that you can do with the, with the, with the AI and so on and the smart cities, uh, etc. 
And then came one of the main organizers of the Paris City, one of the heads of the, one of the main people in the team of uh, Mayor Anne Hidalgo. And he said, okay, in practice, the main things about the, the cities are things that no one has planned. The most important things, the most characteristic features of the city never come from calculation, but from history. You have one sector that is a very shabby sector and that comes out to be rehabilitated into a posh area. Or you have an old monument that is transformed into this. Or you have a local configuration that comes goes from one use to another use. And as to echo this intervention, there was a third participant who said, I used to live in the city that had been planned from the start with a very rational engineer mind. It was the most boring city I ever lived in. And uh, we have to to uh, keep this in mind as in human societies and human affairs in general, very often the most interesting comes from things which were not foreseen or which were errors or which were accidents. And we have to marry both together, the accidents and the logic and the, and the rational. How to organize this in practice is a nightmare. Whatever kind of consultation and consultation you make on the ground uh, are sure to end up in dispute and whatever plan you take as a mayor you can be sure that people will uh, attack you for not having consulted enough and uh, there are many kinds to, of many ways to consult many ways to put together the expertise of the uh, engineers and experts with the wishes of the people and the political vision none of them is perfect it's better if you can uh, add many of these recipes together and uh, here we come, uh, we arrive at the, I'd like to, as a last remark to say, uh, when you look at the development of the city and how you can, you have to do it, she has many points with uh, what you, when you have to develop um, AI projects in which you always have to put together the calculation based on the algorithm and the experience, which is often human experience based on the use and based on the uh, things that are not calculated at all. It has turned into a very, very pragmatic field, much more pragmatic than when it was uh, 20 years ago, much more based on the experience of people, much more based on the sharing, interdisciplinary sharing of uh, tools and, uh, and people. And this is an important common point with the development of cities, modern cities in general, it has to rely on the interdisciplinary crossing of points of view more than ever. In a very, um, in a strong mix of pragmatic and calculation. I will not say more, and uh, we'll insist on the fact that one of the big challenges of politics today is the organization of the citizen's view, the political vision, and the expert's point of view and putting together the three is extremely difficult in practice. And I could see examples of which almost every day in my political life. Great. Thank you very much. Um, it's amazing to see how, although you speak from different perspectives, but you somehow tend to come to similar conclusions, how important the human uh, being is in planning the cities and how important uh, this um, spontaneousness is next to, of course, planning, how important um, human experience or emotion is to shape the cities of the future. And I hope uh, it is rather of a beautiful dream and not a nightmare uh, that Cedric uh, just uh, mentioned, how to make it a beautiful dream and, and not a nightmare. Uh, Francisca, uh, I would like to allow you to respond to what you've just heard. Perhaps you would have ideas how to make it, uh, how to make it as painless as possible and as creative as possible. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Maria. Well, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more with, with what has been uh, said. And I think also it was nice that uh, Francesca Briels put it into the context of uh, obviously the corona pandemic we are right in um, because it's a very critical time, but also to take it more positively, an amazing opportunity to reimagine cities and how we want to live together 
uh, in in the future. And I think it's a very important time and, and a time which kind of forces us to ask and respond to fundamental questions we have been uh, hiding away in the past because it ultima ultimately confronts us with with shortcomings in our societies and with shortcomings in uh, in, in our cities, be that the health sector or uh, public spaces or green spaces. And uh, it has been mentioned a couple of times, we need to democratize our cities. We need more democratic formats. And I think that can happen in, in, in different ways. Is Francesca Bria, she was referring to, uh, uh, to, to, to digital tools and I, I absolutely agree with that we should harness the potential and opportunities of digitalization. I'm not an opponent about it. Um, my point was that we often start with te technological innovation then afterwards ask the question of uh, why did we even introduce that, what was the problem. So I think democratizing digital infrastructure, what has been raised, is absolutely in a way forward. Um, it was also rightly pointed out, it's also a political decision and a political question. Um, and, and I think what's it's nice also now to observe in the context of Corona, I think Bristol is, for example, an, uh, an example where cities are also now experimenting with, with new deliberative democ democratic formats like citizen assemblies to, to reimagine and, and, and discuss in new ways how the post-corona city can look like and how to make uh, the post-corona city more resilient. And I think this is definitely something also to look into. But uh, there's still one argument um, which I think can't be solved with these new formats, which is that we want to become more participatory, but I think the problem is that most participatory formats are either discursive or like based on discussion or visual. Um, and I think there are certain limits here, and this is what I try to, to get across in my message, that we need to reinvent these formats as well, these participatory formats, and also find new avenues for people to relate to discussion and feel part in discussion, because language is power, and, uh, and apart from language, there are also other opportunities we should use. Maybe just as a uh, sum up. Well, that's a very comprehensive answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, which the question is not easy, so the, que so the answer also cannot be too short. But um, uh, I would like to ask you, all of you a uh, following questions, uh, question. Uh, what is uh, your greatest but concrete hope when thinking about the cities of tomorrow? We were talking about COVID, we were talking about all those uh, worrisome tendencies when it comes to um, big corporations and who profits from uh, urban development or technology progress. Um, yes, that are all, these are all threats and risks, but what gives you hope when you, see, when you think about the city of uh, tomorrow? And then uh, maybe uh, let's start uh, this time from Rita. Right. Um. Yeah, uh, thanks for, for that question. I think probably I, I was a bit too bleak in my comments as well uh, previously. Uh, but I, I also would like to say that it's, um, I agree that uh, there are actually hopes uh, that come out. I think I, uh, I, I, um, I have been observing uh, how communities uh, in uh, cities of Southeast Asia uh, are actually coming together um, to, uh, to collectively uh, discuss uh, the problems that they are facing. I mean, of course, this approach is still so much in the problem-solving mode. Uh, I, I would say that uh, there, there are different degrees in which uh, these discussions uh, can go on uh, in various communities. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, the formation of these spaces in which communities start to come together and to organize uh, around issues that affect their everyday lives, uh, that is something that, uh, that, is, uh, that, that is very hopeful. I mean, I can, I can actually cite some, some examples here. Uh, from Southeast Asia, we see, for example, we, uh, 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 not just all the star architects, but we do have, for example, the networks of community architects um, that are actually working on the ground as well as they are networking across cities to share their experiences. 
uh, not just in terms of designing the community spaces, but at the same time in organizing uh, uh, the uh, communities as well. So. I guess these are just uh, uh, some examples. I mean, there, there are also uh, examples of uh, young people, for example, now uh, during this pandemic time uh, that are collectively organizing to uh, go back and promote collective farming uh, because this uh, pandemic time actually uh, spur, you know, the uh, uh, the reflection that the problem with our cities now is actually about uh, uh, the sustainability of the environment as well as food security. And so there are groups of young people now uh, that I observe uh, in cities uh, who are uh, going back to uh, farming collectively, uh, not just individually. So I think uh, these are some hopeful uh, sparks and spots that I, uh, I can see from the region. Uh, and I again, going back to the, know the importance of having the space to do all these activities, to do all these discussions, uh, I think is very important. And that is something that the communities, as well as uh, starting from individuals, but also organizing collectively to reclaim these spaces, no matter how small they are. Uh, but having these discussions, uh, I think that is a, a hopeful uh, sign, I think. Thank you so much, Rita. Oh, that's uh, we are moving towards a positive uh, note. That's very good. <laughs> uh, uh, Francesca, if I could ask you the same question and if you could yeah, uh, use a few words looking at the time in a few sentences, what, what gives you hope? Well, first, I actually would like to say that when we are talking about reshaping our cities and we are talking about democracy and we are talking about more social justice, more public space, better health care, um, ecological transition, more education and so on. I mean, we cannot think that this is easy. I mean, we cannot fall ourselves into a kind of technological solutionism, click here, download an app and you will solve poverty, <laughs> you will make your city green and you will, uh, you know, uh, be better. We have to face the fact that democracy is about conflict. It is about, we have to be courageous, we have to change politics, we have to really want to change re the relationship between citizens and governments and public institutions and also then the relational power with big, big actors such as the big tech, which are dominating the, the social imaginaries about future cities. So, I mean, I don't want to be this is not about being pessimistic or being optimistic. This is about accepting the fact that it's going to be a long term uh, vision where, uh, you know, different interests will be at stake. And we also need courageous politicians that will be able to say, yes, we do want more engagements from the citizens. We want to integrate collective intelligence into the way we take political action. I mean, I think for me, this is the hope because also, as it was said before, we see a lot of activities coming from communities which are experimental, that go in the right direction, but obviously we need to scale them up. They need to become uh, bits and pieces of a, of a, of a large scale uh, social imaginaries that will help us to transform the future. Uh, so I, I, I would say, um, we need politicians to be more courageous, to take, for instance, the question of, of the relationship between technology and democracy very seriously. We do need to invest in sovereign technologies and put this technology at the service of people and cities if we want to achieve a kind of socially minded vision that put the environment and people at the center. So this would be my, uh, my, my talk that it is only possible probably if we um, also look at the capacity of cities to become networks. I think this is what I learned working with cities, that network of um, rebel cities, network of green cities, network of um, you know, digital cities that put people first can really transform our possibilities can show that we have examples 
we have new policies, we have new tools, and we can do things differently. So my hope is in this network of cities that aggregate power and give it back to the citizens and, and show that experiments that go in the direction of more uh, sustainability, more democracy, and more social cohesion is actually possible. That's, that's great. So sustainable cities, but also courageous politicians. And we are very lucky today because we have a courageous politician with us. So, Cédric, what gives you hope in a few words, please? Yes. First, yes, and to, to, to take back a sentence that I just said, it's true that the uh, cities are a more and more important political force and networks, international networks of cities have an important role and are often more forward-looking than states. And, uh, uh, and that is very clear for ecological issues. Some of the main debates about the city today, we know them. One of them is what's the, what's the place of uh, uh, trees, vegetal in general, plants in the city. Actually, Singapore is a fantastic model for that, and one of the one of the cities in which we can see how uh, building and plant can can come together and uh, in a very impressive way. Everywhere, citizens long for more green, physically inside the cities. One of the reasons is uh, to prepare for the war global warming and to make sure that the, in the cities it uh, does not uh, the, the temperature does not become too high one of the reasons is just for reason of the feeling connected to the nature at a moment in which uh, we can see how much uh, the the our way of life has this kind of schizophrenic nature of being disconnected from the from the nature but then to organize it in practice is very, very difficult and to plant and to see where it has to be and how to reorganize circulations and uh, the, the cleaning and so on is quite difficult. That's, so that's one thing, but the good thing is people are longing, citizens are longing for uh, this green aspect of the cities and it's no longer the eerie era of concrete that we saw uh, decades ago. Second thing, which is very much attention in the cities, of course, is circulation and how to make, organize the departure of cars from cities. Our cities have been shaped by car a great deal. The size of cars has increased over the past decades. Cars are becoming bigger, more and more cumbersome and so on. Uh, cars parked are using a space that it's impossible for us to, to use in this way. We need to regain space. In Paris, for instance, one of the big debates, how to regain the objective is half of the parking in, in surface currently and transform it into some other things, some public space that can be used for green, used for, uh, for public activities by people, etc. And um, uh, a third enormous point of tension is how to organize the governance at a scale which often is a scale larger than the city and here also Paris is a perfect example it's a disaster in terms of political organization you have the districts you have the city of Paris outside of Paris you have a number of uh, small cities organized into uh, co co collectivities of cities organized into departments, organized into region, you have like five or six levels of decision between the, the citizen and the natural organization that corresponds to the metropole. This is impossible to organize in a meaningful way. So the, the organization, the local organization and the division is key to, to simplify and to transform into something that is politically active and democratic. Um, okay. Sorry, and um, let's yeah, say it, that these are, these are, this is fuel for progress if properly used. Okay. Thank you, Cedric. This was already really uh, almost a recipe for a good city. So we have communities, we have courage, we have nature. And Francisca, uh, if you were to add the fourth element uh, for hope for uh, cities, but just one, 
almost one word looking at the time. We are, uh, we are uh, beyond time already. Uh, could you please add your part? I think it's flexibility, absolutely flexibility, because I think what, to me, what, what is the positive that, uh, thing that comes out of Corona is that we can really see how governance and planning processes are being reshaped and innovated because the city of the future is never finished. There will always be something waiting around the corner you haven't expected before. And I think we need just more flexible planning processes and public administrations able to react more quickly in such circumstances. And I think it was just very very hopeful to see uh, all these experiments popping up in cities around the world, whether it's Brussels closing down its inner city for six months or Berlin coming up with the pop-up bicycle lanes or whatever. And even it was about trying something out. And I think we should, you know, keep that spirit for the future. I think it's a, it's a really important way forward. Yes. Amen. That's a wonderful sum up of our discussion. <laughs> I'd love to talk uh, with you a little bit longer, or not even a little bit, much longer about the cities of the future and future of the city. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but as Francisca said, uh, building or developing cities is an unfinished project. So I hope to uh, see you and meet you by the next round of Inocracy, maybe next year. And meanwhile, thank you so much for uh, joining us, to all four of you, Francisca, Francesca, Rita and Cedric. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you also to our thank viewers you. and thank you for thank being you. with us uh, for uh, till the end of today. Please remember to fill out the evaluation forms that we have sent uh, via the chat function. And uh, remember to join us tomorrow. We start at 12 with, of course, a future-oriented topic. Uh, overcoming democracy's present bias, how to involve future generation in today's policy making. So tomorrow at noon Central European time, be with us again. As of now, I say good night, goodbye. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you uh, to the audiences and see you tomorrow.